With a new generation of large telescopes in the planning phases, ever more sophisticated mirrors will rely on adaptive optics to help them see farther and farther into the universe. Adaptive optics is conceptually simple. What you want to do is measure the disturbances in your optical system and then correct for them. In astronomy, it's the disturbances in the atmosphere that are the biggest drivers. So you want to measure the atmospheric disturbances. You use a thing called a wavefront sensor. And then from that, you have a computer that calculates what the opposite of that wavefront is, or the disturbance, and then it applies that to a surface, usually a deformable mirror, and that goes ahead and corrects for the wavefront disturbance. It's extremely necessary for large telescopes. Any telescope that is larger than the atmospheric disturbance, which is usually about only 10 or 20 or 30 centimeters, if you have a telescope that's larger than that, you need some sort of adaptive optics. For the new telescopes that are coming in that are 8 meters or larger, the 10 meter Keck telescope, and then the designs for the uh, next decade of 25, 30, and 42 meter telescopes, it's absolutely necessary. Otherwise, the telescope just collects a lot of light and you don't see anything. Adaptive optics is uh sort of a tool with which astronomers uh, can get high resolution images of a star in sort of the surrounding area. And um, with a lot of the new coronography techniques, uh, you can start to dig into some of the things that, that normally limit you in your resolution. And you can start to search for companions like extrasolar planets and extrasolar Earths. SPIE visited the famous observatory on California's Mount Palomar to learn how adaptive optics has been implemented on the 60-year-old Hale telescope. A new system called the Palm 3000 will soon replace the current one. I'm Antonin Boucher. Uh, I work at Caltech, California Institute of Technology, on adaptive optics instruments uh, for, the, for the Palomar telescope. And I'm here at the controls of the Palomar 200-inch Hale telescope. The, the adaptive optic system here was one of the first developed for astronomy, and it, uh, it saw first light in 1999, um, which is, yeah, one of the earlier systems. So it's already been in operation 10 years. Well, actually, we're kind of in the, in the mid-phase of a new project, which is the Palm 3000 uh, adaptive optics uh, upgrade for the Palomar 200-inch telescope. And it's, it's, uh, it's an extreme adaptive optics system, which is sort of a, a new breed of adaptive optics where you know, we're trying to almost perfectly correct for the wavefront aberrations induced by the atmosphere. And using some sort of brand new techniques for searching for extrasolar planets. The astronomers have discovered uh, over 300 planets already, but uh, what's really the, the cutting edge research is to, is to study those planets to try to understand their atmospheres, um, whether or not they might be capable of supporting life, all those sorts of things. So our, our big effort here with the Palm 3000 in, uh, adaptive optic system is to head in that direction and to try to be one of the first observatories to do that. A key innovation in adaptive optics was the development of the Laser Guide Star, first developed for missile defense adaptive optic systems. It was declassified in the early 90s and parallel research was able to build on the military work. When a star is not bright enough to have enough light that you can split it off and look at the wavefront while still trying to see what the star looks like, you don't have enough light to do that. We can produce an artificial star up in the atmosphere. The concepts are shining a laser up into the lower part of the atmosphere at about 10 to 20 kilometers and getting some Rayleigh backscatter or molecular backscatter uh, just like you, you shine your headlights into the fog, you can get backscatter light. Uh, another more efficient way to do it is to shine a sodium laser, an orange laser, up into the sodium atomic layer at about 90 kilometers, very high in the sky, uh, well above the, the disturbing atmosphere, and it produces an artificial star that we can use for wavefront sensing. That, that allows us to look anywhere in the sky without having to have a bright natural source nearby. The use of a laser allows us to correct the turbulence in a direction where there isn't a natural star. Um, so this is particularly useful for extragalactic science uh, studying distant galaxies. From its military origins and most visible use in astronomy, adaptive optics is moving beyond large telescopes and may soon become more widespread. We're starting to think small now. 
So in, instead of these uh, sort of really large long-term projects, I'm starting to get involved in um, uh, this robotic adaptive optics system for, for small telescopes. So we're actually going to try and field a, a, a small uh, cost-effective uh, adaptive optic system for one to two meter class telescopes. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to get one up and running in the next two years and then uh, try and uh, bring adaptive optics to the masses, so to speak. The newest and most exciting application is vision science, being able to look inside the human eye, image the retina, look for retinal diseases, look for the rods and cones, and other cellular structures inside the eye. The vitreous humor, the fluid inside the eyeball, acts very much like a disturbed atmosphere, but it's slightly different, but you still use the same technology. You use a deformable mirror to make your correction. You get a signal from the back of the eyeball by shining a very low power laser into the eye, and then you make your correction and make your images. It's a, uh, happen been happening over the last 10 years or so. It's, uh, uh, there's been a lot of measurements of the wavefront of, of human eyes to try to determine what's necessary, and it's always popular to talk about it because it's a potential for eliminating or preventing blindness in millions of people. So there's a lot of uh, excitement about it.